you see that my dashboard now gives you some options. I have the ability to add more links, to add more images. So I'm going to go ahead and take this off. Uh, so this is the view that my users will see. Um, I have a list of devices here as well. All right, so notice that I have three types of devices. Uh, and then when I click on any one of these, it tells me the different devices that I have under that category. In the in the agenda, we'll cover four things. First of all, start with a real use case and I'll talk a little bit about how the data science work in our job. And then give the the platform look like from data science perspective and then show a bit demo. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how we go. But what Azure Data Catalog is, we'll see, goes in and looks to see what data is in those data sources um, and helps you discover that, understand them, and um, with the thought to, if you know where your data is and you know where to find it, you're going to be able to use it easier. You may have heard the term recently, the data is the new oil. But what exactly does that mean? How is data related to something as monumental of a shift and a major force in our society that oil was? Oil enabled the Industrial Revolution, changes in the way we grow our food, and many more unintended consequences for society. But how does that apply to data? And what does that mean? For us. My name is Frank Lavinia and I'm a software engineer. In fact, I've been a software engineer my entire career. I saw the rise of the web, the dot-com boom, and the dot-com bust. I saw the rise of .NET and the rise of various open source platforms. However, throughout it all, there's always been a consistent theme. You write code, you test code, you deploy code. You essentially write algorithms to solve business problems. 
But data science flips this normal paradigm on its head. Instead of writing algorithms to solve problems, the algorithms that solve problems are already written and you just pick and choose which ones to apply to your particular solution. You don't so much write the code as you assemble the code. Now this is very intimidating and confusing for software engineers. Trust me, I know. But one of the more frustrating barriers is the math. Now sure, you may say, well, we're software engineers, we do math all the time. Well, that's the external perception, but you and I know that's not totally true. In fact, we rarely get beyond simple algebra. Sometimes, if you're writing games, you do more advanced physics and trigonometry, but for the most part, we don't dive too deep into the ocean of mathematics. This is different in data science, as most of it requires some knowledge of advanced statistics. Now, even if you've taken statistics in college, you probably don't have fond memories of it. But I'm here to tell you that statistics are your friend and they're a lot more approachable than you would think. Unfortunately, a lot of the existing training materials are not geared towards software engineers. They're geared more towards, well, the academic crowd. And that can be very intimidating if you're just starting to get into the field when they start dropping all sorts of formula and other things that are, well, somewhat incomprehensible. And that's what this course is aimed to do, to make a statistician of yourself. Well, kind of. It's designed to give you the tools you need to be successful in data science. And trust me, if you're already a software engineer, you already have the hardware and the software to succeed in this field. Over the last decade, the term big data came into prominence and the rush was on, and thanks to the cloud, cheap storage, and ample bandwidth to collect and organize as much data as possible. However, holding the data is only part of the equation. Now the rush is on making data smart data or making smart decisions based on the data that you already have. In other words, companies want to make the right decision at the right time for the right customers to have the best possible outcomes. By anticipating customer behaviors and even market conditions, Companies can minimize risk and turn a nice profit because they are aware of the future before it happens. But how does this happen? Is it magic? No, it's not magic, it's math. And let's get into that now. Everybody, good morning. Um, my name is Tim Mancalilli. I'm a, a technical solutions professional for data platforms and AI here at Microsoft. And uh, welcome to the uh, Philadelphia United Data Fest. There's a good crowd, good breakfast. I spent about six years at Hershey, and this was the last project I worked on before the that. But what I need to do is I need to show you, we're going to talk about, about the use case, how do you make liquor, and inherently the way you make liquor. Thank you for coming and spending a Friday morning, Friday afternoon with us. I feel the weather's going to be perfect. Uh, which changes into the rain tomorrow, so, oh well. Uh, I want to thank my uh, co-organizers, uh, Mr. Brian Moran, uh, Prashant Boyer, and then <laughs> the, uh, the AV guru back in the back, uh, Frank Lavigne. So uh, they all helped out on this and thank them a lot. So this piece, oops. Does everyone have an agenda? Agenda is very important. Part of your agenda, I'll get right back. Your agenda has the Wi-Fi code for the day, you know, for the building. Uh, the agenda has um, 
where you can go and get sessions. Where when you go home, you want to download the sessions. The session download information is at the bottom of the agenda. And the, the agenda is really your guide for the day. Uh, we're going to do a keynote here in a couple of minutes. Uh, then we're going to have uh, three sessions after the keynote. We're going to do a lunch and learn um, uh, with Christian Hansen, who is kind of the services. We'll do lunch and learn in here. So a little cooperation, a little congestion around the kitchen area at lunchtime we can get through it. We're going to take a little bit longer afternoon break um, and break into three tracks. We'll close down all these walls. We'll have three rooms, 3054, 3058, and 3062. There are signs on the glass posted outside each room to you know, let you know what's going on. Um, in the afternoon, the sessions are a little bit longer. They're an hour each. Uh, with plenty of time for Q&A. We have two labs. We have uh, Edbot is doing a presentation with Matt Wade, and that's going to tie into a, um, a presentation or a deep dive kind of lab on uh, training an intelligent bot in under an hour. So that'll tie in together. And then we have Frank uh, Lavinia, who's doing a two-hour Python lab. If you don't have a laptop, if all you have is a notepad and a pen, you can still go to the labs. Just check it out. Learn, you know, you don't have to worry about Wi-Fi or special tools or anything like that. If you do that with your laptop, you know, you can participate in the lab, uh, you know, with hands off. Uh, so hold on to your your agenda. If you don't have an agenda, come see me, come find me. Or we'll also put in a pinch of agendas in each classroom as the day goes on. Now, hold on to your name badge. Does everyone have their name badge? If you don't have your name badge, let us know. We're going to move the registration desk to the first floor. We're going to move it up here in about 15, 20 minutes while Hashish is talking. Um, we'll, at the end of the day, you'll turn in your name badge as your raffle ticket. We have some pretty good raffle prizes. What do we have? Xbox X1. Xbox. Then we have Xbox One. Uh, TV. TV. Well, and some other swag. And some other swag. So it's worth hanging out for. Um, so keep it on, keep the agenda. Um, we also have some other great sponsors. We have data stacks. They're out there uh, in the lobby. They have a table out there. We see uh, uh, the data stack team. Frank runs Data Driven. That's a podcast. Download to us. Subscribe to it. Listen to the good content they have. Uh, we have Witham, Audit Tax and Advisory Services. And that's Prashant's company and Sasha, who's out of the table. And then AppBot. That's Lisa's team and Matt and Joe and Nick's team. Uh, go check out that box. So we have three sponsor tables, and we have a, a living sponsor in front of us uh, for data driven. Uh, since he's doing two sessions, we figured he wouldn't want a man as a sponsor. Um, well, without with that, well, without that, well, without, sorry, have fun, learn, uh, network, keep your name badges. Your badge is your Apple ticket. I'll go ahead and hand it over to Ashish Raman and hear his presentation, which will be awesome. about uh, why it's America, like why aren't you intelligent because everyone is talking 
proper kind of option is not to a blockchain guide to get into this arrangement. Is there anyone here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we'll sit down. Be careful. Uh, the AI is holding it. Uh, I thought, you know, maybe to, it's a good thing to take a step back and then talk about why it really matters. Uh, I'm a Xi German. Uh, I uh, am not that active at Twitter, but that's still like to like to put my phone in there. Uh, on LinkedIn as well, if you want to put uh, the link with me. I work uh, in a, a, a very interesting group in Microsoft called, called uh, Status Security and Democracy. Uh, with a sole mission of uh, helping democratic institutions of the world uh, uh, against the cybersecurity and security to help them mitigate some of the issues. But this is closer to the heart. Right? That's what my day job is. AI has been, has been really close to my heart, and I've been actively working in this space for the last couple of years. Um, the, you know, I want to start with this, and this is a pretty good quote from, uh, from our research. Uh, uh, hey, Teddy Sean. And, and you know, I, because these are not my quotes, I have some notes here after a lot of years, um, if you see me reading, uh, most time I won't. Uh, but his, his quote is, you know, AI will augment our humanity, right? And it will give us, each of us, oh, I hate this. Right? What do I do with this? You block me. Sorry, guys. Okay. All right. So, you know, it, it would give us, each of us, superpowers to tackle really big challenges. Uh, and then the whole idea of augmentation of our powers, right, is not replaced in the modern fact that everyone talks about, hey, we'll replace humanity and the robots will take over and, and you know, those will be able to stop and whatnot. And that's not What AI brings to us is an ability to actually do more with, and, and enhance our, and empower us to do more, enhance our capability, give us that super power that we want. And it doesn't have to be, you know, hey, I want to destroy Mars or something, right? Superpower to, 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 to make real change in the world, right? Uh, provide healthcare, right? At scale, right? Uh, empower people to drive, you know, their mission, the purpose. Uh, sometimes actually, uh, you know, if you go into, into developing countries, you know, access to to healthcare is one, access to education, right? At scale, right? right now, as you see, uh, you know, AI can power, and I'll actually show you a video that I have. Uh, AI uh, can power teachers to actually make a real impact in the life of students. Uh, and, uh, power, that's a big problem. So what, what can, how do we think why AI matters is, is actually in the context of, it would give us powers which would, which would be purposeful in our lives. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Now obviously that's a that's a very high level talk and I didn't want to actually just talk about the, the, the goodness of AI, but also tone it down because it's, it's a dev kind of audience. Turn it down, get a step back and, and talk about you know what it really is, right? How you what, what learning is, what machine learning is, what AI is. Uh, and then also talk about what Microsoft is doing in that space and how we think about AI when we talk about AI. So, you know, I take you back, and you know, everyone knows this. Uh, you know, the, the the history of human innovation, mostly, you know, started with the wheel, right? And the whole idea was, hey, there was something that tried to make world a, 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 a bit smaller, right? Because then now you started transporting goods, you can travel uh, a bit faster to the places that you wanted to, and and bring communities together. So that actually was was one of the things uh, about innovation. Uh, and the, the second thing actually came of being as, as a printing press, which is actually trying to bring the world together from a knowledge perspective. Not physical world, but with knowledge. Uh, then we went back to saying, okay, that's pretty cool. Steam, in, uh, steam engines, uh, faster way to, 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 to move around. Uh, I really hate this, sorry. Uh, faster way to communicate. Uh, not to get but to travel around, fast way to transport goods, uh, bringing people even a bit closer, making the world uh, smaller. Uh, flight, satellites, and the most important in our lifetimes is what we saw from the computing age, right? From PCs to internet, and now we talk about AI. 
Um, so the, the idea of these things, the human innovation, is these, you can think of these as accelerators, right? You know, which, which actually move humanity pretty quickly. Uh, one innovation actually moves humanity towards closer to a, be a more purposeful life, right? We were less bothered now, most of us in the developed nations are, are less bothered with, uh, with our day to day problems or trying to solve uh, different things and different things. Uh, we think that AI actually is a bigger accelerator than any of these. Uh, and the reason, again, is that because it, it looks <coughs> augment humanity, right? Uh, it would be uh, not just augment our humanity, but also, uh, you know, empower others, right? So we, as we get these technologies together, and we think personally, uh, I also think that way, but Microsoft and the whole thing that, that it is bigger than the internet. Yes, internet is a way of communication, is a, is a way of, uh, bringing the world together, but then you know, AI can help us to find a purpose and enable that and empower us to do so. So what is AI, right? And we all, all, all talk about AI. Uh, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, it just, from my perspective, I think it, it, of, of this as, as using what we have, like compute data and, and algorithms, to, to make change. Right? Uh, when we talk about AI, we actually think about it in three different buckets. And I don't have the buckets written here, but I'll try to speak to them. One is reasoning. Right? If, you, if you have a lot of data, can you put some logic on it and try to understand what the data is and, and what, it trying, what it is trying to do? So find some reasoning uh, from the data. So that's one way to look at AI. Second is understanding. Understanding of the world, understanding of the information, understanding of the models around this. Uh, using data and algorithms. And the last thing is interaction, which actually is pretty interesting, and that's where most of the AI conversations are going these days, is, is how do we extend human ingenuity? Right? How can we lower the barriers between people and machines? In fact, you know, what you see today is uh, we've all this time, and I, I read this quote once, uh, you know, I think, I think we are at a point, we are at a cusp where uh, uh, we're trying to understand machines, and, and the, the real cusp is the machines will start understanding us. So that means that then, then we will be more empowered to actually help the machine will be more empowered to help us to, to live a life of purpose. And in a very natural way, right? In a natural way meaning you know, the way I interact with you, right? I can speak to you and we have seen Alexa speak back to us as a whole time. So that's one way to interact. The other way you know, we'll talk about and I'll show you some of the, some of the ways we infuse uh, technology AI into our lives. And we see it every day, right? Uh, AI is everywhere, and they are not really like it. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, again, it's a very bloated term, by the way, right? At this point in time, maybe not in five years, maybe not in ten years. Uh, you know, if I'm, I'm doing something interesting in Excel or writing a, a very smart SQL query, uh, you know, I would think that it is part of this whole bigger AI, one piece in the bigger AI mission, right? Uh, and, and that's what I, I truly believe in. It's, it's everywhere. Computer vision is a big thing, right? I'm sure you've seen that, uh, and we'll, we'll see it as well. Uh, how easy it is to make sense uh, of an image. Uh, you, a computer can make sense of an image. It can actually contextualize an image very, very easily. Uh, I'll show you a demo. Uh, and amazingly, uh, I'm going from vision to speech is the way machines actually understand us and, and from an augmentation of humanity perspective, right? Think about the impact it would have in, in, the, in the accessibility ability section of, of people who actually don't have access to, that's a vision, right? Uh, if I can speak uh, or the machine can translate the text into speech so people rather than visually uh, interpreting it can can, can audibly interpret it, actually is a pretty big deal. Uh, because you know, not everyone ha or have the capability or the, the opportunity to be like us, right? You know, there are people with disabilities and I think AI actually it. Uh, cognitive services, the cogn cognition is, is another thing, right? Machines are actually getting to the point where they have to become aware of the cognitive. I'm trying to understand uh, what people are trying to do. Uh, and then, you know, I'll show you some demos as well. Uh, so here is something that, you know, as I'm talking about these cognitive services, speech, and yeah. I'll just show you some, some of the things that uh, you may have seen already, by the way. 
Uh, but you know, there, there, there are some new things that I would like to show you. Uh, and these are mostly focused on what Microsoft is doing in this space. Uh, uh, and, and you know, again, being very really agnostic, it's not just Microsoft that's actually finding it. Google, Amazon, Facebook, it's all the people. Uh, and they collaborate as well. Uh, so let me uh, pull up this, this demo. And I, on the day, let me share. Oh, and it doesn't show anything there. I know you're looking at this, and hopefully you and I will see the same thing. Uh, all right, so, so if you go to uh, Microsoft.com, Cognitive Services, there's a lot of ideas about Microsoft.com Cognitive Services. Uh, you know, there's a lot of demos, there's a lot of things, but this is where our focus has been from a Cognitive Services perspective, is visual speech, language, knowledge, and research. Uh, you can go and try this out yourself, and this is what I'm doing with my demo, and I'm not building something from scratch, and you know, I'm just going to the website and clicking things, <laughs> and show you, and maybe provide some more context to the demo. Uh, so uh, this is an interesting one, uh, which is uh, given an image, given an image, uh, can I actually interpret the image? Uh, and I'm trying to interpret this. This is a great basket, well, not basket, but exactly the software most. And and you know, and, and I can upload my image as well. But what you see here is is actually pretty interesting. Uh, on the image, it actually has some tags. So machine is trying to interpret this image, and, and you know, we all know this is all deep learning. Well, maybe not, but this is all deep learning. This is what deep learning does. Uh, you you throw a bunch of images and try to figure out what this image is, and then you throw a new one and you say, oh, based on my learning from the last set of images, I think this is what it is. Now there's a lot of data out there, there's a lot of images, but what it is doing is pretty interesting, which is. You know, just say, hey, it looks like I'm 90, almost 89.3 or almost 90% confident that this is a close-up of a food on the table. It looks like the food setting looks like indoor and whatnot, right? Obviously, it, it fails here because it, it says that it looks like a tumor as well. This is fine, right? Because it's not, it's not saying that I'm 100% confident. And in fact, you should be a Beware of, of, of machine learning models that would say I'm 100% confident of the United because you may be for your fitting model as they call it in the industry. Uh, so this is very interesting. And, and you can start thinking about the scenarios that can be enabled now. Right? So uh, a visually impaired person can take a picture of anything uh, or you know may have a reader that actually takes pictures and, and they, you can throw this in the service, it will return back all the tags, and you can actually, based on the tag, you can create a, a voice-based uh, solution for them, so that the address scanning an image, you can talk about what this image is. So again, empowering them to, to do really more, which were, you know, limited experiences of theirs, right? You know, augmenting them to do something, something better. Uh, this is another example of a speech. Uh, and uh, you know what it is is uh, I'll do this, and it's a real time thing, right? And it's just pretty interesting. If I start recording, let's see what happens. So well, I'm, I'm recording this, and I'm saying that AI will augment our humanity, and it will give us each of us superpowers to be challenged of all kinds, including some of our biggest ones. See, this is pretty powerful. Right. This is closed caption my talk, right? I could actually throw this on the side here and start recording and do my talk and people who may not have the, the ability to get everything perfectly can read this, right? And, and it, it still participate in this discussion. It's just pretty powerful from, from an AI perspective, right? That's why it matters. Right? Because that is why exactly why AI matters. Is because now we can really, really, really uh, uh, 
real solution that can empower other people. Uh, I have got many more, right, but I'll, I'll let you actually go and, and, and play with this. The idea of cognitive services is this is the best APIs, right? You can use them very, very easily in your apps, cloud apps or, or devices apps. Uh, rest based endpo endpoint, give us a web uh, voice file, return back the real time interaction and whatnot. Yes, there's one more I'm really sure, sorry. I like this one actually the best. Uh, so, yeah. So this is translated, I'm sure you've seen it. Google has a solution, we have a solution. This is pretty powerful. Uh, and this is a real example. I, uh, me and my wife were actually in a, in a South American country a couple of years, a couple of months back. Uh, we don't know Portuguese. <laughs> and like, you know, while I was uh, doing some work, uh, she would actually go out and, and do some shopping. Right? Uh, and this is what, what, not this app per se, but there's an app which she used essentially talk to the app in English and then the other person, the, the grocery store, or the shopping clerk, or whoever would listen to it in Portuguese. Real world application, right? As we travel, as we are becoming more and more global citizens, this is very powerful, this is very helpful. So, so I'm, I'm trying to log in in, in two places essentially. Uh, one uh, as an English speaking uh, person. And uh, all right, there's something fishing. Playing, not, not. So, so here it is. So I, I've, I've established a, a service, uh, and I'm going to invite someone else so I can actually do this. I'm using two browser just to show you that it works everywhere. Uh, so here I'm an English speaker on the on the edge, not not English speaker on the edge, but. In the <laughs> <laughs> and, and here I am as an English speaking person. And the reason I'm going to show this is because you're going to be language that I know. Right? I wish I could, I could learn more about different languages as well. Uh, and then I cheated. What I meant by that is I actually prepared for this sort of thing. I was just copy pasting because I don't know how to type in my keyboard and can ask for the typing as well. So I can. I can start writing it, and I can speak to it as well. Right? So, so, you know, we have support for uh, for English speaking, and but you know, I don't see here maybe that we don't have support for Hindi, but you know, there are other languages that we can support for. So I can actually speak to it. So I'll say hello, and some of you actually can know, right, or understand Hindi as well. That is actually is doing this, right? It's just pretty powerful. And what I did is copy paste. This, you know, I show you. So I'm saying, hey, Chief, what are you doing? And it's real time. It actually is just you're having a translation. Pretty powerful stuff. Pretty, not just powerful, but would have a real world utility to it. Archie, does it have local language support as well? Yes, so there, there are actually a uh, hundred arts languages. I can actually uh, do this. Uh, not this side. And I don't remember how these languages support, so what I'm going to do is we will read this page. Or you, we can, you can figure it out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone, 
when you start seeking purpose, right? And I'm out of college now for quite 20 years, and my son is starting to go to college, so now it's time for me. I have to be like, I have to take my purpose. Yeah, I can tell you. Uh, this is one, one that I want to show you as well. So the thing that we are doing, and this is more about education, how we can scale, uh, help teachers to scale uh, using technology. This is an old video, by the way, it is uh, 2016. Uh, but now this is in production. This, I think, one of the research videos, but now we have it live. Um, we'll the voice. If you're non-verbal, constructing sentences and um, sort of understanding the semantics of grammar is not really that obvious to you. So the idea of Suki Symbols is that you can select a number of pictures from a set of symbols that constructs your sentence. So you can say that um, an autistic child, for example, could create a sentence using pictures and yeah, can read it aloud to their parents or their teacher or their carer and, and vice versa. I feel hungry. The Riverside School that we're working with um, has ordered a bunch of tablets so they can roll out to other classes. It seems to be a successful hit with the kids. They're picking it up relatively easily and it's helping them use words and concepts that they weren't able to before. And there are a few apps out there that currently do this sort of thing. Um, but we've integrated our predictive technology at Swifty to be able to allow users to really quickly navigate through a whole slew of pictures that you would usually take ages going through all the categories by predicting things you've said before. And that makes it astronomically faster to be able to build the sentence. So, hey, this is just one second. So, is the, um, Daniel Gaspari here? I will sell you your wallet. <laughs> he doesn't have any money. Yeah. 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 Ye
you know, imagine the kind of sleep that we'll get, right? You know, uh, I don't know if you have it here, but you know, there will be eventually signals and microphones and, and projectors and, and everywhere that you have to just keep on playing signals back at some, some big data warehouse and have to say, hey, you know, maybe it would, uh, it would augment that signal with your Twitter, Facebook, feed, and blah, blah, and eventually say, I see, you know, maybe there's a signal in the mind and the next talk, it won't actually use the word AI because everyone is actually covered in off of it, right? So that kind of uh, thing would happen, and all because of this, this, this pretty interesting uh, uh, the idea of cloud, massive data, and AI, AI innovation, the perfect storm of uh, for AI. Uh, now, we, we talk a lot about AI, if we want to take a step back and talk about what exactly these things are, what is learning, we, we talked about AI, all about learning, machine learning, I'm sure you, you all know about this, uh, uh, but it is just to wait for, for the computers actually to model the world around us, right? It's a pretty broad statement to model the world around us, but essentially thinking, uh, looking at the data and saying, you know, does it make sense, you know, uh, are there specific aspects of it that actually I can model? Uh, deep learning is, is an approach to machine learning where uh, it tries to mimic the way brain functions, right? Where neural nets and whatnot. Uh, thinking in terms of abstraction and representation versus uh, you know uh, machine reasoning, if you're looking at the data and then trying to figure it out. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk a bit about deep learning. I'm sure there will be sessions today. Uh, about that. And reinforcement learning is actually another subclass of deep learning. Uh, and the whole idea of reinforcement learning is uh, that, yeah, that the computer does a couple of actions, and based on the outcome, there's a kind of particular, like carrot and stick, right? If it's successful, then it will known to the computer that it can go back and say, hey, these are things in those steps were successful, I did that. And these are things that did that. And and the whole idea there is actually it's very useful in robotics, uh, where you know you take and, and you take a couple of actions and and figure out you know humans it becomes natural to actually walk and talk and and those other stuff the robots is not. So you know, eventually after a couple of iterations, thousands and millions of iterations, it actually to figure out you know hey where did I I suffer most from a penalty perspective where did I not um, and then. It, actually represent that, that model. Uh, transfer learning is a new term. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of it. Uh, but this actually, the term uh, was published two, two years back in terms of research papers. And the idea is pretty simple, which is uh, there are some domains where you may not have a lot of data. Right? So can you use data and learning from a different domain use it enough and transfer it to a domain where you may not have as much data and much learning. Uh, very novel concept, very interesting one. Uh, uh, especially the word idle uh, as a day job in cybersecurity, this is actually one of the big things that, that we are talking about because uh, uh, machine learning and AI and cybersecurity is a hard problem to solve because you know, uh, yes, you can look back into the data and say what kind of vulnerabilities and what kind of attacks were there. But as the vulnerability is closed, nobody cares about that anymore, right? So, they, so, so you have to actually predict on what is coming uh, without knowing the vulnerabilities or the zero-day uh, vulnerabilities out there. So, so this is a very normal concept in, in cybersecurity. Still trying to figure out, uh, you know, how to use that uh, Again, just a uh, just a quick snapshot of what AI is. I'm not, this is a animation, but I'll actually go through this quickly. Uh, the idea is very simple, actually, if you think about it. Uh, a lot of data, it contains patterns. Uh, machine learning algorithm tries to find patterns in it. Uh, we create a model that can recognize that, uh, that, that um, pattern, or codify that pattern. Uh, and then we do an application once we publish that model, that codification of that pattern. And I was saying, you know, looks like this pattern works. This is not. That's the crux of it. Uh, now, this is very simply five models of what machine learning and AI eventually is. But this is the actual thing. There's nothing 
bigger than this. I mean, they, you know, there's a lot of data. Uh, there's a lot of uh, algorithms, and, and uh, it uses a lot of them to make that matter. Right? 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 We talked about a bit about training data, what training data is, right? I don't know if we uh, if, if actually explained it, but you know, uh, for a model, to build a model, essentially, to recognize that pattern, uh, uh, you have to have a lot of data that could be labeled or not labeled, depending on, on you know, what kind of data you have and what you want to get the model from, uh, to get the model working on. Uh, so the, the data that you give to, to build a model is called training data. And then, you know, if it's a labeled data, then, then in the machine learning it's always called supervised learning, if it's non-labeled data, then it's called supervised learning. And then, you know, these are the two types of learning. Uh, there's a hybrid as well. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's, that's more or less what it is. This is the most common approach. Now, with that said, uh, I disagree with that statement. This was, the, this was the most common approach. Uh, as we have more and more data coming, this will be coming out of the common approach, especially in the scenarios where we have some recommendation engines, uh, where uh, you know, there's some label data, obviously, you can recommend using supervised learning, like, you know, and I'll give an example of Netflix. If I go on Netflix, it would recommend some shows to me based on my previous viewing history, but then it also recommends me uh, some movies that I have no clue about based on uh, unsupervised learning, which means that it tries to put me in a, in a cohort saying people like me, right, what they like and try to recommend that to me. So that's unsupervised learning. And supervised learning is based on my actions, previous viewing habits, unsupervised learning is based on other people which Netflix things are like me. And that could be any criteria one like me. Right? Yeah. They're watching a lot of printing data at Edo, or they're watching a lot of Hong Kong, whatever that is, right? Uh, so, so I, but more and more, uh, what we see here is unsupervised learning, which is reinforcement learning as well, and then not to be able to do that. No? I'm sorry. How does it it's work? Uh, I'll give you a very simple, simple example. This is how my brain works, right? It is, okay, I always go to Seattle, uh, I look at the flights, and there are a couple of criteria in my mind. I may not have put five them in a paper or written somewhere, but that's how I would think and most of us think is, you know, when do I have to be there in Seattle? How much does it cost? And am I in a frequent flyer program in the, for that airline? And based on that, I'll make some bad judgments. Uh, and, then, and then I'll say, hey, I'll take it or not, right? Again, the, the model here is simple decision tree, but it can get very complex as well in the other model. But from my mind, in a simpler mind, I'll say, hey, if it costs more than $500, I'm not taking that flight at all. And if it does less than $500, I may take it, but then it also depends on the idle time. Like, if I am meeting at 10 a.m., you know, I don't want to be there at 10 or 9. Right? I want to be there before. Uh, I, I have to have time for, for some uh, yes, within the, the arrival time span that I want, then I start thinking about, hey, do I have a secret flag program? And I enroll into the secret flag program for the secret uh, okay. so, so that's how I look, and eventually I say, okay, this makes sense. If it's cost less than 500 within four hours of arrival time, and I'm in the secret flag program, I'll fly. And then what happens is I'll take it and not take it out the labels, right? Eventually, this becomes a training set for a machine learning model, and, and you know, there's a lot of data about what I've traveled in last 20 plus years. Uh, what it does is it actually tries to quantify it, and the next time if I want to go to Seattle, it will look into all the flight data and say, you know, you can take it uh, and, and But having said that, you know, obviously the, the, the <laughs> The holy grail would be that few books for me, but I still don't want to. I just want this to augment my decision making. Right? Because it actually can present you with option. But you know, obviously the holy grail would be that it actually not only books me, but it actually and not just books me on the flight, but also books like Uber and Lyft on the other end. 
puts it on the calendar, and then people know if I'm running late, and blah, blah, and all that can be done as well. The process, you know, I'm sure you have seen it a lot, actually. I'll say this is the most important part. The thing with AI, the thing with machine learning, the thing with this concept of, uh, of, of learning is bad data would yield bad results, right? So, so, so it's pretty simple, right? If, if there is bias in the data, there will be bias in the model, even though the machine created it, right? Uh, so I'll say 80% of the time, for uh, uh, any data science engineer, any machine learning practitioner should be here, right? Cleaning the data, making sure the data is prepared or prepared. Another 20% should be a you know, thing of the models, uh, finding the end date model eventually, and find the best model of uh, Simple process. Uh, one thing that I, you have to start thinking about as you get into machine learning or AI is it's different from, from the way you think, the way you improve it. Uh, you know, we being programmers uh, think about being there. But anyway, the idea is pretty simple that you know the course goes from top to bottom, we like control statements, we like, you know, and then you know eventually uh, it's a flow where you know the code enters and then you know there's some computing and then you get an output on the way. Uh, well the machine learning AI is different. It's, it's all about the right? It's all probabilistic flow, which means uh, you know the more data you put in, uh, the more knowledge you learn. Uh, there's no flow which says, hey, if, if these are the five characteristics uh, in a case statement or an if else control flow, then it may be a doll or it may be a cat. It's very probabilistic. It's all about confidence. Okay? It's about you know, how confident I am that this is a doll or not. And this is a deep learning kind of example where you have first layer uh, and then the output layer and then there are multiple different layers. Uh, and it's, as, as we talked, as I said, you know, it's very uh, abstract way to think about this, right? Which is, you know, I, I, I put in a lot of animal data in there, in the images, uh, and then I, I tell the, 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 the model, the label it that these are the dog images and these are not. Uh, and then every layer does its part, right? So every layer actually can, there could be a layer that can look into the, the, the abstraction of the face, the way the tail is. Uh, the linear, the curves, and everything, and eventually get to a point where you can say, hey, I'm 90 percent, 90 percent confident this is an image of a dog. So that's a slightly different way of thinking from a programmer's perspective. And this is my last uh, slide to talk about machine learning AI, and then I'll jump back into how Microsoft sees things. Uh, but you know, again, some of the examples, regression. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, the first thing that, that if you become a practitioner, if you start learning or knowing about data science, you talk about regression. Right? It's a very easy way to predict a, a new value for that. Right? Uh, the, the example that you see is uh, housing prices. Right? That's, that's a very simple example where you know, based on the location of the house, the, the number of bedrooms it has, the type of marketing or whatever, right? you can say, you can say this, uh, what the price of this house is. Uh, uh, so that's regression, uh, uh, you know, numerical value prediction. Uh, decision tree, it says decision tree, but this is classification more or less. We just saw it, which is, you know, it could be binary, two class or multi class classification. Uh, say the year and eight, right? Uh, which is, should I take, will I take the flight or not? Maybe the terms of the bottom. Neural networks with deep learning uh, tries to mimic how how brain works, the neurons and, and the signals that go from one neural to the other. Uh, Bayesian is very interesting. It actually is the probability on the hypothesis versus probability on data. Just a different approach to, to look into, uh, into learning. And k-means is another way of clustering, essentially. Creating cohorts and, and without label data can say, hey, these folks or these items look same or similar versus these items. Uh, has a ton of uh, value uh, or usage in, in these new implementations in that kind of approach. So where do we as Microsoft uh, think where, where our space is in the world of AI? 
Uh, these are the three key investment areas. The platform itself, we are the world's biggest software platform company. Uh, uh, so we want to make sure that we are the platform of choice for any AI practitioner, any machine learning practitioner. Uh, again, our goal as a company is to empower everyone, right? Uh, which means that if you build a platform, we can help you empower, which will, will empower you to empower others. That's our goal. So we have a lot of investment on our platform side. The other investment we actually have, and I'll show you some of our investments there, is infusing AI seamlessly into the product that we have. Uh, we are actually, hey, in your face, now you get a um, AI-based word you know, to write letters or documents. You know, it's like they seamlessly infusing that. And, uh, and then obviously, you know, there, there's some investment in the business division area. You have some software and service investments that we know and and know and, 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 and like as well, and like Office 365 uh, and CRM. So the platform, I'll quickly go through it. You know, we have infrastructure. Uh, uh, you know, we have all kinds of VMs out there, like right, on our platform, which is Azure, uh, CPU, GPU, and PTA. Uh, and then on the platform chip check, you know, again, some of these things like GPU is, 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 uh, is needed in, the, in terms of deep learning in this classification. You may not need as, as, as high power GPU, so there's a lot of those that you can do with GPU and PTA. Uh, on the data itself, you know, we have solutions for big data, simple data, no simple data, you know, possible, simple, I don't think you call that. Uh, and on the compute itself, like DSVM, a data science virtual machine, it's a pre-packaged virtual machine for you. You just go and click, and all of a sudden you get uh, a virtual machine with, uh, with all the all the things that you need, like Python, R, and other stuff that you need to be a, an, an awesome uh, AI engineer. A batch AI, you can learn top million, well, not million, I hope it is, but thousands of sort of jobs in parallel. Uh, and then Kubernetes services. Well, from a services perspective, right, we, we saw uh, a bit about cognitive services. We also have bot framework out of the box, so and you can, you can build really impressive bots. I wish I had shown you a demo, uh, maybe, maybe next time. Uh, and then machine learning, custom services. So you can actually think about uh, bringing your, your existing knowledge, existing a lot of the existing data into the service. See what you get, you know, drag, drop stuff, and then create a model of publisher. Make a solution to market. From a tooling perspective, right, we have deep learning framework, not just CNTK or cognitive toolkit, which is Microsoft, uh, Microsoft deep learning framework, but we have first class citizens with TensorFlow and KFA and others. And, uh, so, you know, TensorFlow, most of people actually know or love as well. Uh, can bring it on as or in fact you can get it as a first class internet for the position that has it in the store. Uh, on the tooling we have Visual Studio. Uh, it has all the capabilities that you like and love as a as a dev option here. Uh, uh, we have uh, Azure Machine Learning Studio and what uh, I want to talk about infusing AI and I'll show you two examples of it uh, instead of talking about what it is. And the, the, the interesting example is right there. So where do I give you in this line? But I can do it, I can actually I'm creating a new new slide. Some, some very interesting visuals on the slide. I don't have to do a lot of work. 
I can write a picture, and all of a sudden they say, okay, you know, I know what you're trying to do here. Uh, this is the right one. So this is kind of modeling the infusion of AI into the product that, that we want to use. Um, without thinking too hard, it makes it pretty easy for us to actually pay something else. Right? And then I can publish it. And these are pretty good looking slides, right? I could, I could not even think about creating this slide by myself. So. Um, I'll show you another example. Uh, this is, uh, you know, you all have resumes, right? You all have to be one, you know, one type or another. Uh, if you go to review tab and, you know, there's this, uh, this resume assistant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can link your, your LinkedIn on your dot, right? And they said, hey, you know, if you type in software engineers, this is how other software engineers like to really talk about their community capability and their impact. And you can actually learn from this. Pretty simple. That's what I mean by, by infusion, uh, infusing AI into a, into a product line. Uh, essentially, that's another thing in this And the third investment area, uh, which is the business AI, uh, which is Again, going back to the, the simple idea, of, you know, there is a lot that we can do with a platform company. Uh, one of the things you can see here is, uh, uh, you know, on uh, on Office 365, uh, we do ATP, advanced threat protection, use a lot of AI in the back. Right? Sometimes, uh, uh, most of the time, you don't actually even see the phishing attack or the malware that, that someone is trying to deliver to you because we detonate it before it even hits your inbox. Right? So that's all based on some of the, the machine learning principles of AI that we are on the back. Right? Based, on the, based on the other end of who is trying to uh, deliver you that, that phishing attack or uh, you know a lot safe link and whatnot. We, we do a lot of AI to the back, right? So, so that's uh, uh, this dot AI services. Uh, where we see a lot of patterns, especially around impact, you know, is, is AI assistant knowledge workers. Uh, <coughs> precision engineering is something that we are actually investing a lot as well. Uh, project is called Palm Beach, if you go and, go and learn about this. Uh, especially in, in countries which may not have the right kind of resources to, to do agriculture, uh, we actually would look at a, a lot of weather data, historical data, uh, soil data, and whatnot and then uh, uh, notify the farmers actually when to sow, when to harvest, what kind of crops they should, uh, they should uh, so, uh, bring, uh, and all that. So that's, that's pretty interesting actually from an AI perspective. Again, think about impact, right? When we talk about AI, think about the impact. You know, can we empower other people to create impact and change? You know, have a purposeful life and change. Yeah. The last slide is, you know, what are Microsoft's AI principles? You know, as we talk about impact, as we talk about AI, and why it matters, <clears throat> I want to make sure that, that we all see this, you know, how we react to that. These are our guiding principles of AI, which is, you know, hey, you know, it should maximize efficiency, but it should not really destroy the dignity of people. Which is another way of saying that, hey, you know, robots won't, won't come and take our jobs away, but we are still trying to augment the AI principles to do our jobs. Uh, guard against bias because again bad data brings bad results. So, you know you have to con be very conscious about about the data and what kind of biases the data may have. Right? Uh, you know, I don't want to go through the examples, but we are seeing the today. Right? There are tons of examples of machines uh, predicting that someone will not find a lot of data from that data. Right? Or makes it <coughs> Accountable, transparent. Private, you know, obviously designed for, for privacy, and must be designed to assist humanity. This is the last bit of it's actually pretty far. Uh, so that's all. Uh, I am proud to be at the finish by the time. These are some of the resources. If you want to learn more, the AI school at my side is a pretty awesome resource. Uh, I learn a lot from there as so, well. Uh, and uh, AI for all. 
if you need to use a restroom or something, yeah, you do that on your own or whatever. Um, but we'll get everything set up and keep going. <laughs> Alright everybody, good morning. Um, my name is Tim Mancalilli. I'm a, a technical solutions professional for data platforms and AI here at Microsoft. And uh, welcome to the uh, Philadelphia United Data Fest. There's a good crowd, good breakfast. I spent about six years at Hershey and this was the last project I worked on before the that. But what I need to do is I need to show you, we're going to talk about, about the use case, how do you make licorice and inherently the way you make licorice is the problem with licorice is because you make it in large batches, 500 gallons, and then what happens is it starts to cool. Well, as licorice starts to cool, the viscosity changes, and as you try to extrude licorice and the temperature is constantly changing, the viscosity is constantly changing. So you're always playing this game of how hot the licorice, how viscosity, how much should I extrude, how fast should I extrude it. So you can imagine you're playing this chase your tail all day, every day. So, so I try to do a video of inside the lactic or plant, which is where they make licorice, and of course Hershey said, no, you're not going to make a video inside the plant, it's be nuts. So on our first tryout is, is what we refer to, this is the difference between and what we had to teach the engineers, was on the left hand side is what the engineers were very comfortable doing, all of the math. We know how long it takes to cook, we know what happens to all the ingredients over time, and they did all the math. But I told you, we're always playing this chase my tail, right? We're always playing chase my tail. On the right-hand side is the key to the machine learning, right? So instead of me trying to mathematically calculate what is the heat dissipation of a four-inch stainless steel tube over 20 feet, I don't really care. I don't really care what it does. But what I can do is I can take all the data points, second by second, and I can determine did it pass or did it fail? In this case, I had 22 sensors, and then I was able to every second say, did it extrude the right weight of licorice? Because what I was shooting for was weight. Anything engine and we had an out. Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of people get to the last I had some friends. They basically said what happened. Last year, we were about the last year, we were talking 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 the we were talking about the last year, we were talking about the last year, we were in fact, it's not that they aren't important, but my first thought is, why do I have unnecessary depth? Yeah, yeah, really what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, not, if I'm not doing that, if I'm not doing that, then you kind of walk out of like, I'm unnecessarily uh, writing the you know, like if I'm not, then like you can walk well, in like a like real yeah. 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 Anyway, so how are you? Yeah. Eventually you get into the, uh, because that is important too. But Chad, the other one, the reality is, there's a lot of people who are going to really screw up the program by, you know, simply just by not being an inefficient fashion. Like, those type of 
you know, what are the key characteristics of an MO-based program? They can adapt to changing conditions. They can solve problems with little incomplete knowledge. They can handle large data sets. They can detect anomalies. And I don't know about you, but my programs actually tend to get worse over time. They don't get better, right? And I was fascinated with this idea that software, that machine learning seems to be getting better over time, right? So I was thinking to myself, this is really the question I posed myself three years back. So if it, and I can do all of these things, what can it do for me as, as a software developer? Okay? And turns out that you may have already figured this out, but it's not, I'll give you a few examples. You're already using AI, ML, in the development tools that you use. An example, if you're using IRC code databases today, a lot of internal scaling and giving and things like that happen in machine learning. Okay. App inside, some of you, you have built applications that are running in Azure, and you're using the instrumentation library called App inside. There's a new tab or a tile there that says that something is wrong, something looks unhealthy, based on a machine learning pattern, it can tell you that the application looks unhealthy. Of course, you will imperatively define, hey, the CPU utilization goes above 95%, let me know. You can set up imperative things about health, but on top of that, it is doing some anomaly detection telling you that something is unhealthy. My favorite, snapshot debugger, right? One of the things we miss in the cloud is you know, you're not just sitting next to the machine that your application code is running. So what is the middle of the night? You have crashes after crashes after crashes. You don't want to get a core dump of each one of them. Snapshot debugger is intelligent enough to know that, oh, this is a new type of an exception. Let me capture a couple of snapshots. When the developer comes in next morning, I can just show them that right data. They don't have to go through 20,000 core dumps to figure out what's happening. And you know, my favorite example here at the bottom right, I, I wrote a very simple program for a customer uh, being used today is, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a large consumer of Azure, and myself, people in the room may not like me for saying that, but, uh, but I trust it's not nothing bad that I'm saying that they're, they're, as I said, they are in, in, in encouraging you to use this. So if you're a large Azure customer, and you're worried about what is your monthly bill, and you can, you know, in fact, my, my subject, what I company called Plugin, it's integrated into the portal, which tells you how to optimize your, your spend in the cloud. And that's great for sort of the top 10 things that you're spending on Azure in optimizing it. My problem was, what about that low-grade finger problem, where something just goes up little by little every month, and how do I detect that? Because there's no way of doing that. You know, I'll give you an example of app inside related. You know, we're expecting to send, spend, let's say, five thousand dollars a month across multiple installations on app inside. You know, I made that number up. Suddenly, that number one month went to seven thousand. Why? Because somebody changed the sampling rate on app inside, and you know that two thousand may have not been noticed for that month because it is not a top ten tier, top ten consumer of fashion. But you know, something is happening. And you wrote a program which does some detailed analysis of the Azure tools and looks for that low-grade fever problem before it becomes a big business step. So clearly there are examples of machine learning applied to uh, software engineering. And you know, I'm going to skip this slide because Ashish just covered it. There are a number of platforms and tools and things like that. And let's just skip through that. I'm going to focus on one, uh, which is the Azure Data Fix. So I'm going to show you some examples later on. There are a number of ways you can write these machine learning algorithms. I started out doing a lot of work in Azure Machine Learning Studio. Off late, I've been doing more and more in Databricks, which is think of that as an integrated analytics platform where you can do analytics and machine learning. And I really am gravitate towards this notion of a notebook, where you can write your algorithms in Python or Scalar, uh, and then you know, just execute it in this manner. So I just wanted to point out that this is the tool I'm going to be using when we see the demonstrations. And you know, you know, Databricks is is uh, you know it's a Spark managed Spark service which runs on Azure, first party service. You go into Azure portal, create an Azure Databricks, and, and you'll see an instance of that shortly. Focus on the last bullet. Notebook is, is a web-based interface, which is really uh, very popular among data scientists. Where you write all your algorithms, they're using to test their tech, visualization and things like that. Okay, so I'm going to now shift gears 
Let me have a quick check at the time. We are 10.15. All right. Let me shift gears here now that I've motivated this discussion about you know, why machine learning is important to software developers. Now let's just shift gears and talk about some concrete examples, including demos. Right? How many of you have heard of the term post-program synthesis, which as the term suggests, somebody is generating the program for you. Right? Ultimately, if you think about it, what is machine learning, right? Machine learning is, you know, in a traditional software development environment, you go to a developer and say, these are my requirements. They look at your requirements, design a system, generate code, and off you go. Right? That's the classical software development cycle. What happens in machine learning? You don't give them the requirements, or you give them the requirements essentially in the form of input-output. And the program looks at the input-output and then synthesizes a program. You don't have to write that code yourself. The machine is synthesizing that program. That's the fundamental difference, right? Everybody agrees to this. Simple, or simplified, uh, you know, um, summarization of what ML is. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of program synthesis that you may or may not have already seen. So, you know, most of you are developers here. There's no show of hands. So if I came to you with an Excel spreadsheet like this, So very simple Excel spreadsheet, right? I have just two columns here, column A, column B, right? So if I came to you guys and said, hey, can you write a column C here which can calculate column A and B? Most of you would say, well, that's no problem. I'm just going to write a macro or do something and write some formulas and do that. What if you were just not inclined to write macros and things like that? How, how can you do that? And many of you know this, or maybe some of you may not, I don't know. There is actually, a machine learning component built into Excel. So go on and try this. So I can go in here and say, let me just show you, I don't know how to write a macro, I'll just show you an example. I'll just do this for this right now. And then I'm going to, you know, you can see my keystrokes when I said control T. E. Basically I told Excel that this is my intention and Excel came in and said, oh, that's what you're trying to do. First column, combine with the second column and did that. Now, it didn't quite do the things correctly. Uh, you know, in this case, this column was blank. And, and you know, I, I really wanted to say null when column B is blank. Right? That's an additional. So you know, that, uh, the program didn't know my intention up until now. So now I'm going to go back here. And if I you know, let it run again, then it, it now learned that so it can go on and on and on. It, it can do quite sophisticated things. Right? So here's an example of something that, you know, you synthesize this program of concatenation. And well, we have quite, not quite figured out the artificial approach of getting the power to my machine. Well, this is, turns out that this is another user error. You have to plug it in. So, you know, OK, all right. OK, great. All right. I'm happier that now I've got power than the fact that the demo works, but that's, that's just me. Okay, so, you know, I was thinking, okay, this is a great idea. They, they took this program synthesis idea and baked it into Excel. How can I bake it into my C sharp program? Because ultimately I want to boil it down to a C sharp program, right? So it turns out that there is a library, let's just go here, there is a library. Uh, that, that, uh, that's available on GitHub, and actually let, let me run this code and you'll see, see what's happening right here. And, and let me just, let just take a, let's just take a look at this piece of code. Exactly what was happening inside Excel, I come in here, I provide an example, and then I teach this library called the normal library, this example right here, right? I teach it this example. Once this example is complete, I can then write code like, now that I've, I've, I've learned this program that you have mined, and I can just, once I can start running this in my code. Everybody see what's happening? I'm not going to run this program, but available in GitHub, I'll make this slide available, and you can just see that, so you don't have to, you know, whatever is done inside Excel is available to you in C Sharp. So, Imagine yourself that, you know, I was told to write some complicated string manipulation logic. I can either do all of that myself or I can provide some examples and have it 
learn it as part of my code and then generate that code on the fly. So that's just one example. Let's just keep going. Before I go, let me load another project just to save us some time. Yes, and let me just uh, I'll give you the sound here so we can blow this. Let's just go back to the slide. So I, I showed you the first example, the second example of program synthesis library. I want to show you one other interesting example uh, about what can what can uh, machine learning do for your uh, software developers. Right? Let's just go here, and this is uh, a project that came out of my sub research. Right? It is called the auto grader. So you know they were teaching this class. Uh, I think this class was being taught at Stanford, and and you know this is uh, I'll show you the program. It's a very simple program because. You know, uh, computer science, um, you know, I think the first or second class for undergraduates, they were teaching this class on Python programming. And maybe the first exercise to the students was, you know, how do you calculate the derivative of a polynomial? It's okay. very, very simple to do that, right? You can calculate the derivative of a polynomial. And, you know, when the students were like 30 students in the class, you could actually walk up to them and say, your program is wrong in this way. But as the number of students increased, you know, Stanford started offering this class online. So the number of students went from 30 or 300 to 30,000. And there was no way to sort of give them feedback other than, please submit your program. We will give you an input data set. Submit your answer. And if your answer is right or wrong, you get full marks or no marks at all. Right? So that was not really helpful. So uh, this, this chairman, Rishabh Singh, at Maxwell Research came with this idea that wouldn't it be nice if I took a, a program and then I took the common mistakes that students have made over the history of running this class, model those errors out, and then apply it to a standard solution to this problem. Right? And there's a part that there's a lot of work happening in this area. Right? We, we talk about natural language processing all the time. But you know, if you think about it, software programs are a way of communication. We as software developers are communicating with the machine, and that's our language. So if natural language processing is all about processing what humans are saying, if we can apply deep neural networks on the code that is available in millions and millions of lines of code available in GitHub, maybe we can glean some interesting patterns out of that. Right? So here's an example of Python code. Let me just run this one code for you here. So this is a simple demo of, you know, I think this program is almost right. We don't have time to, you know, normally I, I, I would like to walk through every aspect of this code, but we don't have time for that. But you can go play with this link. I'll make this link available. Let just get some feedback about this program. It takes about 40 seconds. At this point, what they're doing is synthesizing this program and then comparing it to the standard output or the standard result. And then, you know, able to provide something like, hey, your program is almost correct. Only if you change a couple of things in the program, you almost get there. Right? I showed it to somebody in my office and said, can you put this in production? We need to do this the right away. I said, you know, uh, this program is still in an experimental stage because, you know, the problem set is pretty small. Right? You're trying to find the derivative of a polynomial. Right. It doesn't apply, but you know, real uh, hope that you know this can turn into something more interesting. Okay, let me show you one other example from Andrew. Uh, this is a very interesting example, and, and this is actually Andrew's PhD in computer science about this. So, you know, Ashi said something important, which is you know, uh, machine learning is not here to replace programmers, and, and all the things that I talk about, they're not about replacing programmers. That, that's you know, that's the science fiction. Uh, but what we can expect is it can make us more productive, right? So here's an example where, you know, you have essentially a whiteboard that can generate some code. So this is a program running in the behind. So what Andrew does as part of this demo, I'll just show you, give you a little clip. He goes into the whiteboard and, you know, draws a data structure, and in this case, a linked list. So he draws a linked list. And then he tells the computer how he does a reverse of linked list. And by showing a few operations, the computer is now able to generate some code. So let me let me run this here. And in fact, we don't want the audio. I, I can provide the audio. So here, here he comes in, says, do you know what a linked list is? I don't. OK, let me show you what a linked list is. 
Okay, can you then show me how to reverse this link this? Okay, this is how I reverse it. And then once, okay, now now that I've shown you a few examples, in this case, how do you reverse it? There's a single element in the link list, you don't have to do anything. Okay, fine, now the computer is done, and at some point it can start generating some code for the automatic. Okay, so this idea of taking a programmer and just making them more productive. All right, let's just go back to the slides. So I talked about flash fill program synthesis, auto feedback, and some storyboarding tool right here. All right, so I'm now going to uh, shift uh, shift gears here, and I'm going to start talking about uh, what I call the hello world of machine learning. So if you are new to machine learning and you're trying to learn the first three things, you know, as developers, we tend to gravitate towards hello world of everything. And to me, the hello world of machine learning are three algorithms which I'm going to show you in the context of a software engineering problem, right? So, so the hello world uh, of machine learning to me is uh, logistic regression or linear regression. And uh, one is the naive base algorithm, which Ashish talked about the probabilistic distribution. And then the third one is Keynes clustering. And I'll have an example of all of them in the context of software engineering. So I, I think we already talked about this. I'm going to speed up to this here. Everybody understands linear regression, right? It's just a modeling a relationship between two variables. And so uh, let, let me show you an example. So first and foremost, Before I, so you know, this is sort of the third part of my presentation. We were talking about why software engineering and machine learning converge. And then we talked about program synthesis in the second part of my session. I'm going to now go into data bricks. And, uh, you know, Jason was supposed to help me with some demo. And I'll say, sorry about that. Okay. All right. So, now we're going to go into database. How many of you have seen database? Okay, good. All right, so for those who have not seen it, let me just show you a very, very simple example that Ashish already talked about. And this is why, you know, I have, this is just a personal preference out of the many tools that are available. I, I like this model of, you know, I can code it up. And the word book or the notebook, sorry, if you have not seen this, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful model here. You can essentially, you can write some code here, and you can execute it, execute that code, and you can, you can also plot the code and things like that. So let's just, in this case, uh, I think Ashish had a similar example. All I'm doing is I'm just predicting the price of a house based on the median population, right? And I'll just walk you through a simple example here so that you know, I can leverage that later on. So uh, first and foremost here, I read some data that was provided to us, right? So read some data. And, and the beauty of uh, one of the things that Azure Database offers is you know, all my data is stored in log storage. And you know, as soon as I'm done doing this demo, I get to shut down the Azure Database and only pay for it when I'm running an algorithm, right? So it's, just, it's really uh, simple. In this case, the cluster I'm running is not a huge cluster. But you can absolutely spin up a cluster instead of you, you can ask for GPUs, you can ask for any size of the cluster and things like that. So I'm loading the data from block storage. And so I'm loading the data right here. And then I'm just displaying the data. I don't want to make you dizzy, so I'm going to go slow here a little bit. Display the data. And this is really our label right here, right? We, we are That's our label. And um, I don't think it's here. The, the, actually, can you tell me, guys, I'm fine for my session, but the mic keeps going on and off, so unless it's yet another user error, the battery might be low. So right here, OK, so I, I want you to pay attention to this code here, right? Here. And so let's just talk about it for a moment. OK, and I'll go to this side, because I think press the other side on this slide. So just, just take a look at this code. How is simple for us to understand, right? All I did was I created a machine learning uh, database cluster. And once I created a database cluster, I said create a new uh, notebook 
inside the notebook, I loaded some data which is stored in block storage. And just to give you a couple of lines of code here, I am using the Spark ML library. And by the way, I don't have to be into the Spark library. I can use TensorFlow or CNTK, uh, as was said earlier. In this case, I'm using the Spark ML library, which gives me linear regression. So I, I spin up the linear regression, and then I try to fit the data. Uh, remember, we loaded the data, and then we did all the things that Ashish was talking about. We split the data into training and, and then testing. We load the data, and then we, we gen up the algorithm in two different ways. And you know, whether you, uh, you know, in this case, the second parameter, the regularization parameter, is 100. And this is the key part of machine learning, of course, that you know, the first is you have to get to the right algorithm. And second is, even when you get to the right algorithm, you have to tune it to make sure the results are what you want it to be. So in this case, I'm spinning up the linear regression model. But in this case, the, the regularization is set to 0 and 100. And you'll see the difference between the two later on. So the so the model, make predictions, and then the beauty is right here that you know I, I can come in and just attach this code book to a cluster. I just created a cluster an hour ago. And I can essentially run this. You can see I can run an individual cell, or I can run the entire board book right here. And once I do that, I can come here and get this plot. Let's take a look at this. The red and green lines show me the results. So this is all the plotted data. The red and the green lines show me the results between the two parameters that I change. So everybody just, I'm going to be using this model repeatedly for my demos, and I just want to make sure everybody's comfortable with this, this idea. Okay. So I have good uh, 20 minutes or so left, which is pretty good. I, I wanted to show you one other example before. Uh, <coughs> I know that Prashant later is going to talk about this. Prashant is going to talk about cognitive services to go attend this session. Uh, I just, yeah, this is uh, going in, uh, in and out. Okay. So I want to show you an example of cognitive services. So uh, up until now, we've talked about program synthesis. We've talked about prediction. Let me show you one other example of the services. Let's say I want to raise the volume a little. Let's play this video, okay? And select this and I'm a lifelong learner. Uh, I get energized when I see people achieve high standards in anything uh, at work. No t-shirts for guessing who that was. But we want to we want to see if we can call one of the cognitive APIs to go analyze this audio and see and detect who the speaker was. So where am I going with this? Once again, you know, I'm a software developer. I've been asked to you know synthesize some code here. Maybe do um, you know based on an audio detection. I want to cater to a certain user. I want to personalize some data. All I need to do is you know, make a call to the cognitive API, ask an audio clip, and it comes back with some results. So this is just a bad interface that I built on top of cognitive API, but I, I didn't build this. This was built for Steve Michalaki. Uh, so let's just go analyze this data. And the subject has been identified. And zoom into that, but you, you guys can see this. See this. The, so the confidence level is high that the subject identifies the weak subject in the data. Right. So one other example of you know I don't need to be a data scientist necessarily to to take advantage of all these algorithms. This is all about taking advantage of what is already available to make my programs faster and more efficient. So this is the cognitive, and if you, if you want to understand all the full scale of cognitive API, yeah, what is available, go to Prashant's session. Right. OK, so now let's get back here to the slides. And I want to uh, talk about a couple of examples here in 
edge of machine learning. So number one is predicting software faults. Okay. So it turns out that NASA actually put out a very interesting data set where they put out this, this data set which says, you know, uh, they have this data set which gives you information out. Let's just go here. So we're going to about all of these features, right? So they give you data about, you know, based on the cytometric complexity of the code, based on the, the length, volume, difficulty, based on the line of code count, based on the unique <coughs> operator. These are different features that they are using. And they put this data set out there, right? And the idea is that if you are a software development team, if you calculate these parameters of these features, on your own data set, you can use their training set to predict what kind of software faults can you expect. Have you done it me so far, right? So, and this data set is available to you. In the previous slide set, they made this data set available, uh, and you know, I have the links where you can download this data. So what I did was, I took their data set, and let's just go to Another word book here. Now this is not new to you guys, very similar to what I showed you earlier. I load the NASA data set right here and I load this data. And in this case, and these are all the features that I was talking about. You know, the, the data has all of these features, the cyclonic complexity, all, all of those features. And what I do here is and let me just go down. I, I load this data, clean up some data, load it into a, a, you know, a data frame. Essentially, this is the data frame right here. I can analyze this data. And you know, once again, dumping the data down. And what, what I want to do here next is Because you know we've been doing 
uh, some major modernizations where people have come in and said, you know, these are large global systems, and we need to move these systems to Azure or, or you know, some of the modernized platform. So in, in many cases, you, you go to a customer and say, you know, okay, here's this complicated piece of football for really documentation. There's no documentation. Uh, so you know, this idea that, you know, can you uh, take a piece of algorithm or a piece of code? So in many cases, not only do not you don't have, not only don't you have the documentation, there's no source code available as well, right? I see some head nods, so I'm not the only one has seen this, right? So complex piece of code, 30, 40 year old mainframe code, nobody's ready to touch this. And how do you deal with this? You know, all you have is the binary, which has been working fine. So this idea of, you know, somebody's going to do a deep learning session later today, so it's important a session. I don't have time to talk about sort of the fundamentals of deep learning, but took this idea that can you run this algorithm or this piece of binary a billion times, feed it input and output, and then use that input and output to train a neural network and then generate some documentation based on that. Right? So this this is this is the idea that I was going to talk about. I have an example right like here of that. Let's just go back to my Databricks workspace and this is my reverse engineering example. And the idea is very similar. In this case, what I did was, uh, I don't have an OPIC COBOL routine to try out here. So what I did was, remember the linear regression example that we had in the previous one? I took the, I, I ran it hundreds of thousands of times, took the input output of that linear regression, fed it into a neural network, and said, how well can I my neural network get trained and once I have my neural network trained, can I sort of generate some documentation based on that, right? And in this case, uh, to Ashish's point from earlier, I'm not using Spark ML. I'm just using Tensor to run the neural network. So once again, the routine that I showed you from the linear regression, call it thousands of times, put the output, and then train the neural network, which is a Tensor, essentially. And if you can, if I go further down here, you can see uh, I got this data set and I want to go to cell number seven. Here's where I'm setting up all my hidden layers for the neural network. And I'm setting up how many neurons per layer and all of those things. And if I, if I run this program, and this one takes, takes longer because I should have put a GP, it's you know, providing the GPU based cluster. So this takes a while. And then I can go you will see how well, yeah, right here. Let's just let's take a look at this. This is what it's showing you. So the, the, the blue line is really the prediction based on the linear regression. And the green line, hopefully you can see this. Green line are all the predictions that are made from the reverse engineered neural network. Okay, pretty interesting. So the workbook allows me to do all of these things quite easily. So everything with me so far, this is another example of, you know, can I reverse engineer this code and now I can generate some documentation. So can you, can you explain it again? What, what did you do again? Or did you okay, yeah, I, I knew I was talking too fast. I'm not doing a good job. So thank you for calling me out on that. All I did was, so you get the idea that I'm talking about. You know, you have an okay piece of code. A 20-year-old COBOL program, which is run on some, some version of COBOL compiler and some mainframe library, you don't have any documentation, you don't have the reliable source code, or you have a binary that have, people have been calling, right? So that's the, the motivation for this use case. Now, you take that binary and you call it like hundreds of thousands of times. So now you have an input and output data set. And I took that input and output data set and trained a neural network based on that. And then once I had sufficiently trained it, and I had to, I had to try, I had to, you know, modify the number of layers, modify the number of neurons, and things like that. And, and you hear all of that in the deep learning session later today. If that those things I'm saying is alien, are alien. Once I trained it, then I, I, I started comparing it with what would the linear regression do. And this chart shows you. The linear regression is lying in the blue, the predictions, and the green are the predictions made by the trained neural network. Okay. 
you don't look to convince. I, I see some gentle eyebrows and clenched fists. So, and so the training data for the neural network was the same training data as for the Correct. But well, well, the important point, I didn't train the linear regression. Two, uh, I, I, uh, uh, I have to make some modifications to the linear regression algorithm. It is not exactly the, the example that I showed you. And I, I can show you exactly the changes I made if you find me in the hallway after this. Yes, sir, there's a question in the back. Uh, is there any other problem? Yeah, there, there will probably be. And, and you know, my, exa my example here is to, to um, you know, motivate a discussion. And in this case, I'm not, my goal is not to replace that cobalt routine with with this routine, you know, because, you know, as soon as it goes into the real world and it sees some example which it has not seen before, it will do that. But hopefully I can begin to reverse engineer some logic. Maybe that feeds into some business analysis as I try to modernize it and things like that. So, so you see your comfort threshold will depend on how much data is available for you. But these are the kinds of things that we can do. Once again, my talk is really about there are these interesting tools out there. How can we sort of apply that to do what, what we are doing today? And I'll give you another example. I worked on a machine learning project recently where we were doing some recommendations based on you know, some data that was coming every night. You know, this was sort of federal agency. Data came in every night. We were making some recommendations. And, and you know, we seem pretty good. Our tests showed that you know, the recommendations were pretty good. And we wrote it out. You know, the end users were not happy with the recommendation said, why are you showing me this article or why are you sending me to this? And it turns out that, you know, that algorithm really didn't meet its needs, so we had to go back and, and you know, go, in this case, we had to go back to the profit modeling, which seemed to work better than, than the original algorithm that we had. But the point is well taken, and for those who could hear his question, said, which part? This looks like an overfitting problem right here, and, and you know, for the given data set, it, 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 it very well is. But once again, if, if I was truly trying to solve this as a business problem, I would get a larger data set, and then I would try to not use this as a canonical solution for this. I would try to reverse engineer some logic from it. All right, how are we doing in terms of time? Okay, I have about three or four minutes left. Let me show you one final example, and I promise I will let you guys let you guys go. I actually have two examples, but in the interest of time, we'll get to only one of them. Uh, all right. So, so, so the previous example was predicting software faults. This example is about deriving functional specification. The next example I want to talk about is. Uh, you know, many of you run load tests uh, for a production system, and and one of the interesting challenges that we ran into was, so you know, you want nightly bills. If the bill reaches a certain quality of metric, you automatically kick off a load test. Right? That's that's our CI/CD process. Right? You automatically kick off a load test, and you share the results of the load test with the individual teams. And what we found was. You know, for the first few instances, then this was a novelty. People would go actually to the portal and take a look at the road test results. But then nobody, after a while, nobody was paying attention to what. Right. So, how do we can we use some machine learning technique to where you know humans are not very good at looking at the load test result day after day after day and trying to figure out what has changed? Humans are not very good at doing that. So we said, how can we sort of make it easier for human beings to know something has changed drastically? So you know, found this paper written by somebody at the University of Washington, which is about automatic detection of performance deviation. Right? And you know, I want to I want you guys to pick up a common theme on this, right? Every time we ran into a problem, it's not like we were come I came up with this automatic deviation detection, I did not, right? I mean, that's just not what I do, and if I wanted to, I probably could come up with something like this. But there's a fantastic amount of machine learning research happening all the time, and just going and finding these things out there where people have done this research and trying to use this. So I was talking about topic modeling, for example, that was developed by 
somebody named uh, somebody at Princeton, David David Bly at Princeton, he had made that library available as an R library, which we can just run inside that in the data box. Right? So, so it's about picking the algorithm. So in this case, what we ended up doing was I get load test data, and you know I'm getting like hundreds of performance counters back as part of my load test results. And many of those, you know, once again, human beings are find it difficult to pour over hundreds of performance counters and see what has changed. Really hard to do that. Right? What this paper says is, let me show you a diagram right here. What this paper says is, can you generate a performance signature based on that data? Right? So that you don't have to look at hundreds of columns of the spreadsheet and see what has changed. So what they do essentially in this paper is, they run a k-means clustering, clustering algorithm on the data and figure out a smaller signature based on that data. And once you have a smaller signature, uh, you can just come in and then start uh, you know, looking at the data much better. And what we did was we, we created a performance signature. And if something changed significantly, then we would notify people and say, hey, this load test ran, but your subsystem was significantly slower than the, other per, uh, than the last build. Okay. And, and that was certainly a helpful thing to do courses. I'm, I'm almost done. OK, let's go. OK, that brings me to, to my last, absolutely my last example, I promise. How many of you have heard of a term called fuzzing? Heard of fuzzing? Right? And you know, most, of, most software companies use fuzzing of some sort or another. And the idea of fuzzing is that you take a program, and you basically generate malicious input into that program so that you cause that program to crash. Right? And, and you know, any major large software vendor has some sort of a fuzzing tool that is in production. I guarantee you that. In fact, there are three types of fuzzing. I talk about uh, you know, black box where you don't know anything about the program, the white box that you know something about the program, and then there's a gray box, which is a combination of the two. So, so how does machine learning can help with fuzzing? So it turns out that you know fuzzing is nothing but you know you you take an input program or input to a program, sorry, and you mutate it, then you cause a crash. And this idea of mutating your input so that you have covered the entire spectrum of the input, that's a challenging problem. Yeah, because the input can be complicated. So if you're trying to change that, mutate that input. Uh, you know, step by step by step, it is a computationally, you know, enormous problem to get to every element in that large spectrum of data set. So, once again, there is this concept of neural fuzzing where what you do is you run some sort of a black box fuzzing for a period of time, and then now you have some data about you know how many crashes that you've caused, and once you have data about how many crashes you've caused. You can then, uh, you know, take a neural network and train it on that data so that something like this would happen. You know, I'm pointing to the screen here. So what you do is you, you, uh, as you're mutating your input, you go to the neural network and say, is this the right input? And neural network can tell you if it's useful or useless. If it is useless, then you don't try to fuzz using that data. So what have you gained in this model? You gained in this model is, and, and you know, there are papers out there that show that there's a 20% improvement over how you can get data. By the way, there's a tool out there, some of you may know this. There's a tool from Microsoft called Security Risk Detection Tool. You can download this tool and apply it against your program that's based on this model. In fact, uh, I have, if, you, if I go to my Windows, uh, my Linux subsystem windows here. See if I can. I think I lost my connection to the VM, but I'm not going to bother logging in. I, I had this new puzzle running as part of a Linux virtual machine in the cloud, and you know I was using a plain one. So with this, I think it's 
time already. So let's see. Yep, we have 1055. So I was told to go on only until 1055.